good evening and good afternoon so i hope everyone's doing well uh, and taking care of themselves in terms of the corona virus taking around so continue lectures taken by my colleagues dr priyank patel and dr chintan desai let me introduce myself i am dr mithin i am an orthopedic knee surgeon you can hear me right again could you give me a yes on the chat if you can hear me please yes sir all right so we sort of have a group practice and four of us working together i am the knee surgeon i work out of two clinics in bombay one in south bombay that's the aci gambala hill hospital and the other is another clinic in mulung west i also handle the department of pediatric arthroscopy and sports uh -huh. medicine at the srcc children's hospital and have some work out of wokhart mumbai central and jupiter like i mentioned four of us work as a team so that's chintan desai who is a shoulder surgeon i'm going to use my cursor as uh, just to annotate things Dr. Priyank Patel, who is a spine surgeon, a knee clinic that's run by me, and foot arch clinic that's by Dr. Abhishek Kini. Four of us run this thing called as Advanced Orthopedics. Today we are going to spend 45 minutes discussing everything about the ACL and around 15 minutes for question and answers to discuss at the end of the session. I am a consultant for Smith and Nephew, though that shouldn't affect the talk as such. and also a board member for an ehr electronic health record company that's in graf india so we're going to divide this talk into parts apla wala pani mute karaycha na give me a second i'm just going to go back to my zoom and try and mute everybody here hmm hmm jinda kar ke lagte ta Yes can i request everyone to go on mute please good neck surgery ke bare mein bata rahe hain normal surgery jaise hoti kaise hoti hai dekho na and all of you can still see my screen right super all right so we're going to talk on demographics and risks anatomy and biomechanics diagnostics the surgery per se recovery and return right i tried the command control m which is something to mute everyone but suppose it is in working so this is a model of the knee and what we want to try and understand is exactly where the acl stands on these figures so you have the femur at the top the tibia and the fibula at the bottom the patella in the front and the femur and the tibia are held together in place by around four, four to six ligaments that's bone connecting bone and there are two meniscus is right in the middle so you know blow my cursor over it that's the fibular collateral ligament that's the medial collateral ligament the big bundle there is the posterior collateral ligament the posterior cruciate ligament and right in the center here is the acl this is looking at the knee from the front and if you look at it from the back of course you're going to see the pcl right end on and then there's the acl so we're going to start with absolute basics and try and take it from there so there are two three things that everyone main padhai par wo dada hamara lecture chal raha hai main thoda aage jaa the acl is a primary restraint to anterior tibial translation second Two third of the injury is non-contact, so you don't really need to go into an accident or fall down uh, to sustain an ACL. There may be certain inherent factors or something wrong around you, and you may just injure your knee. 
excuse me sir increase of course increase the risk of osteoarthritis so if you can see this graph at the bottom what you can see is the risk of osteoarthritis is say 7 to 8 in a population of 100 in normal knees excuse Around me dr meethen uh, yes. this is gaurish here uh yeah, i think you will have to mute everybody again because there are a lot of people joining in and there is a lot of disturbance coming so it it was hung for a bit but i think i managed now so um, dr meethen even your background there is a lot of disturbance we are hearing can you please take care of that no there is no disturbance because i am the only one here but i am still going to try is it the ap that too loud it is in thank you sorry sorry okay can everyone hear me now clearly and i am assuming that everyone else has been muted so hopefully there won't be a great amount of noise uh whilst i'm continuing with the lecture if somebody can help me uh, there's an annotation at the center of the screen in terms of a yellow line if there is a shortcut yes. to remove this then to post it on the chat group okay super so we are talking about the acl injury uh, increasing the risk of osteoarthritis and uh, if you have an acl then can you see the blue bar slightly higher than the other one but the more worrisome part is if the acl is absent then you are going to be more prone to meniscus and cartilage lesions which are going to increase your risk almost five times per se to a normal acl injury we are going to start with simple demographics just so that we come to understand why this lecture is very important around 3 in 100 females 2 in 100 males suffer an acl injury if they are in the active population the risk of acl injury is around 1.5 times greater for females and the return to sports after the acl surgery if you notice is 81% return to some form of sport 65% to the pre injury level and 55% to the competitive level so if you notice you feel that four and five can go back to sports but if you're looking at professional elite level athletes then it's just around 50% uh it's a little worse for athletes that are age 19 and under so adolescents are at a much greater risk if you look over here the risk of the second acl injury is around overall risk is around 15% and for athletes that are aged around 25 or under it's 21% and that goes to around 30 to 40% in athletes aged 19 or under so two things to remember females are at 1.5 times the risk of males and two the sad part is that just 50% of all those who have an acl injury are able to return to the same level of competitive sports so one in two when we look at and talk about non contact acl ruptures of course there are certain environmental factors and that's very basic that's your footwear and bad weather and poor playing surface and of course females that are more likely to get injured but we should be talking about certain other factors that all of us must know certain things that you're born with so you may actually have a smaller acl by area and volume if you are short statured uh if you have smaller knees and if you have a smaller intercondylar notch you may actually have a smaller acl and that may require less energy to break also there are recent papers coming out that if you have a higher tibiofemoral slope the tibial slope the posterior tibial slope then that predisposes you to uh, an acl injury smaller femoral notch width so if you can see the diagrams at the top there are three of them over there and this is an end on view of the femoral intercondylar notch the notches are of three types so you may have a very narrow notch that looks like the letter a you may have a wider notch where there's a lot of room for the acl and you may actually have a bigger acl in this these kinds of notches and that's a u shaped notch and then there's there are some kinds of notches that are more like a w you know but again very wide 
the point that I'm trying to make is if you have an A-shaped intercondylar notch, that's a very narrow notch. So it's more likely that you have a smaller ACL. This is commonly seen in adolescent females. And uh, these are inherent to ruptures with poor loading patterns and other risk factors involved. Next, if you have, like I spoke about just a fraction earlier, this is a diagram that talks about the tibial slope. So the diagram in the middle shows the femur, the ACL, with a normal tibial slope that's around five to seven degrees. If you have a reversal of slope that's not seen generally, uh, it's not very common unless it's post-surgical, then something like this is actually protective to the ACL but makes a PCL instability more common. But the one that we see more often in our population is something on the right-hand side. That's uh, an increase in the posterior tibial slope. So if you have an increase in the posterior tibial slope, it's but natural to think that the tibia is going to slide forward and the femur is going to slide backward, making it inherently more unstable as a knee. And the cutoff that we have as surgeons is 12, 12 degrees. So if we see a preoperative patient with a lateral x-ray of the knee having a posterior tibial slope of more than 12 degrees, then as orthopedic surgeons, we are thinking, I just don't need to tackle the ACL. I need to tackle the bony morphology as well because if I give this patient a new ACL or conserve the patient hoping that the ACL will heal, the bony morphology is not going to be very kind to us. The other thing, the other risk factor that comes up after this is generalized laxity. So there's something called as Baiton's criteria, B-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. Baiton's criteria scored out of nine. So two points for the fifth finger bending up to 90 degrees. So one in each hand. Second, if your thumb can be opposed to the wrist, so that's one point for each hand. Elbow hyperextension knee hyperextension and if you can touch your palms to the ground with your hips flexed and knees extended then that's one single point so this is scored out of nine and if you have anything more than four so that's five six seven eight or nine that means you are hyperlax and if this generalized hyperlaxity is a risk for you to injure your acl Genurica Vatam on the left-hand side is non-modifiable, which is part of the Baton's criteria. Next, women need to know that the hormonal cycle, the menstrual cycle also has a great risk factor. So we know that the ACL is made of collagen fibers and collagen per se changes, doesn't change, but the histology changes depending on the level of the estrogen and progesterone in the body. So there are papers that say that all those adolescent female athletes, especially girls who are in their ovulatory phase, are at a much higher risk of an ACL tear because of the increased laxity not only in their ACL, but in all the ligaments in their body during that phase. And it's actually progesterone is protective. So the luteal phase is something where they have noticed a reduced risk of ACL injury. In fact, uh, I have some colleagues who are taking care of major league soccer teams and uh, they caused a big controversy because there are two patterns that are being seen in the US. One, where they're talking of starting athletes, female athletes, certain female athletes between the age of 15 and 19 on oral contraceptives, just so that especially those with a lot of neuromuscular risk factors to protect them from an ACL. And second, they have a huge cord strength. So imagine that you have a female cricket team that's representing India at the World Cup and you have 11 players, but instead you form a cohort of 13 and all those players who are close to their ovulatory phase between say day 13 and 16 of their cycle are benched just to protect them from the injury. These are controversies and uh, we can discuss these later. Right, so there is a question on the chat group that talks about 
people who practice yoga with practice develops flexibility. So is that considered laxity? No, what we're talking about is non-modifiable factors. These are certain things that you're born with. So the laxity that we want to check is something that's inherent that differentiates you from other people around you. So any sort of increase in range of motion across any joint with yoga is not a risk factor for an ACL. Next, so there are certain biomechanical lo loaded, risk loaded patterns, you know, so there's something that's provocative and there's something that is safe. So when we talk of risk factors, what can actually make you a greater risk candidate for an ACL injury? The commonest thing that we talk about and discuss is this photograph that you can see at the bottom that talks about a dynamic knee valgus. What's a dynamic knee valgus? That includes femoral adduction, knee abduction, uh, internal rotation of the tibia, foot overpronation or ankle eversion per se. And all of this leads to an increased risk for the ACL to strain and then go on to tear. Again, uh, if you have a higher quadriceps to hamstring recruitment ratio, a lot of quadriceps dominance, or basically limb asymmetry, if you prefer uh, one limb to the other. So this is seen sometimes in club level, kabaddi players or soccer players that we see who haven't been trained great. So uh, for example, a kabaddi raider always prefers, say, a certain leg, a right leg for all the raids. So this is an inherent leg dominance issue. And these kind of neuromuscular patterns should be looked for because they are definitely a risk factor for future ACL issues. Uh, same thing with truncal dominance. If you are leaning towards one side, if you have core weakness, it again gives you a risk to the ACL. So why we are discussing all of this is before we go into treating the ACL, we must know what really leads to the problem. And uh, a lot of our treatment and responsibility to the society should be directed towards preventing these. So if we have sports exercise physicians out there, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, even general physicians, then you must know what you want to go out and talk to school children and uh, sports teams about. So if you can see this female photographs at the top, the provocative position is trying to reach for a ball that's in the front with a hip at a greater flexure ankle, uh, with the ankle being dorsiflexed. And you can see that that's considered a provocative position, whereas a safe landing position is something where everything's in one line. That's much safer. All of these we can modify. What we can't modify, what we discussed on the previous page, to repeat again, one, you may be inherently born with some valgus at your knees. You may have an increased posterior tibial slope. You may have a narrow intercondylar notch, an A notch. And because there's less space in the notch, you may have a smaller ACL itself. Right? So the injury prevention specifics all go around all these risk factors. So a successful program should include strength and power exercise and a lot of focus on neuromuscular training. Uh, all of these neuromuscular rehab programs must be made a part of the regular warm-up of a school routine. So when I was in school, uh, I was part of the district and state level basketball team and the badminton team. But we never had a regular warm-up program that focused or told us Hey, don't lunge or land in a certain fashion. Instead, you can do it the other way. You must focus on performance. So you should try and tell them that trying to land with your knees coming down closer together, not a good idea. Try and, trying to lunge forward and land. Uh, especially, uh, so something like basketball and soccer have these provocative positions very commonly. So if you can go to any local school, speak to the trainer, the athletes, and their coaches, and discuss these few things, then it's going to make a big difference to the society. How do you find these players at risk? So there are a lot of ways, and people go on to motion analysis, video analysis, uh, gait analysis. The simpler, easier ways to do it, to record it on your phones, is a drop jump test, or, an, or a less, that's a landing error scoring system. You can uh, 
look over these and read about them and that's how we find players at risk so we are, i told you that i'm a part and i'm heading the department of pediatric sports medicine at srcc hospital so we what we try and do is we find cohorts of under 11 under 13 under 15 and under 17 uh at schools like cathedral and campion and uh, we started with a cohort of schools in south bombay and we go and speak about these things and when we talk of injury special uh, prevention specifics i just want to mention that just injury prevention is not enough we must be discussing a lot of things related to sports injuries in this adolescent cohort that includes uh, say exertional collapses uh, what's to be done on field if there's a concussion and so many other things but these are simple things that we touch upon before we go into the acl because again almost all focus of discussion on anything related to sports injury should be on prevention there's a question in neuromuscular disorders such as post stroke persistent genu recovatum secondary to muscle weakness may lead to acl injuries would any surgical intervention be helpful so ligaments per se uh, that's the question that has been asked on the chat group and i'm just answering that that uh, we must have our priorities right so we have bones in our body and the muscles around them and then we have joints that connect bones to bones and ligaments and tendons that handle the delicate movements at these joints so the priority in order should be that the bone should be per functioning perfectly if the bones are functioning well then the muscle should be working well if the muscles are working well then we should be concerned about the ligaments and the tendons that may or may not have gone wrong and if all of that is perfect only then it makes sense to treat cartilage issues inside the joint so if you're talking of a post polio residual paralysis say with quadriceps atrophy and a grade 0 or 1 par and the same affected leg has an acl tear uh it's going to be a prolonged discussion with the patient post examination and evaluation whether it really needs to be treated so the photograph that you can see on the screen is the fifa 11 plus program so we are part of the international olympic committee sports uh sports team as such and what they say is this is one handout that you can print from the internet and give it to all the children in your society and all the schools around if they are playing football and soccer then there's a basic warm up program that all of them should undergo of course children are not little adults so fifa 11 plus kids is a separate program for kids and then we always insist that all the kids and their parents must install this app called get set get set's an app that's come out i mean that's been released by the international olympic committee itself and has these basic exercises that are sport specific that can be used as warm up or can be used after injury to get back to a state where you are at low risk for an acl so we now start with the basic anatomy so that's the femur tibia and the fibula the patella at the top i'm talking about the picture on the left and you can see the acl right up there if we go dwell much deeper into this so these are part of uh, a dissection log from my time at km you can see the acl over there you get a perspective of the size of the acl compared to the femur and the tibia if you look at these pictures it goes up uh, from the tibia just very close to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and on to the femoral condylar notch you can see that the notch in this case is very narrow it's an a shaped notch on the right hand side the acl has been cut from the tibial side and then now the acl has been detached so on the right you can see the tibial attachment insertion site and on the left you can see the femoral insertion site one very glaring fact that you can notice in these pictures is that the tibial insertion site is pretty broad if you can notice it's around, so when we actually measured it it was around 14 mm in breadth and around 17 mm in length 
Whereas if you notice the femoral insertion over here, then this one is, it's a straight line. It's like a ribbon. So this is an indicator of things that we are going to discuss. If you see the meniscus and you see the ACL, you get a sort of perspective of the sizes or the proportions that are present in the knee. Everything is very small. Uh, if you notice that the ACL looks much smaller than the menisci actually. So what's the shape of the ACL? And that's been a long drawn debate, uh, especially in orthopedic circles. Why it's important is one, when we are trying to recreate the ACL that's reconstructed, then we want to reconstruct it very close to the way God has given us the original ACL. So there was this gentleman from Pittsburgh, Dr. Freddie Fu. Uh, the gentleman on his side is Zlatan Ibrahimovic, the famous footballer from Manchester United who injured his ACL and was treated in Pittsburgh. So he said that the ACL is made of two bundles. There's an antromedial bundle and a posterolateral bundle. So ACL is not a single bundle, it's two bundles. And then there was this guy from Poland, Robert Schmigelski, who went on to say, hey, no, there are no two bundles on the ACL. The ACL is flat. It's like lasagna. It's like a ribbon. So you can, he dissected around 93 knees and he didn't find double bundles anywhere. So this is called the ribbon concept of the ACL. And that's Konsei Shino. Shino's from Japan. Professor Shino is one of the authorities on ACL reconstruction in the world. And he dissected his 80 cadavers and found that each ACL has three bundles, not two. So there's an antromedial bundle, there's a posterolateral bundle, and there is an intermediate bundle. So these are the photographs in different sections where he proved that there were three bundles. So the confusion is, okay, is the ACL a single or a double or a triple bundle? So should we do a single bundle reconstruction, a double bundle reconstruction or a triple bundle reconstruction? What's been proven for sure now, and it's been published multiple times, is that the ACL is not uniform from the tibia to the femur. So the femoral insertion is flat and it's like a ribbon like the photograph on the cadaver that you saw. And the tibial side, it's, uh, it's like a fan. It's much broader than what we expect. Now, why is the ACL different from the MCL? That's because the MCL is outside the joint. Once it's outside the joint, if there's any tear to the MCL, then there is an opportunity for a clot to form. Once there's a clot, then there are lots of healing factors that come in and that's how healing can happen. The, the problem with the ACL is it's intra-articular. So if it's intra-articular, there's always going to be synovial fluid that seeps in, doesn't let the clot form at all. So even if you let a simple tear to just be there for two months and three months and four months, it's likely that no healing may happen. About the biomechanics, you can notice that the ACL is not isometric. So it's not the same length in extension. It's not the same length in flexion. So if you do an anterior draw in 30 degrees, and if you do an anterior draw in 90 degrees, it is possible that you may get some more anterior tribule translation at 90 because the ACL graft is as such, the tension flexion curve of the ACL the original ACL is such that at 90 degrees, it's a little lax and closer to 10 to 20 degrees is where it's maximum tight. So we discussed the healing potential of the ACL that's low. And that's because one, the synovial fluid that's in the knee. And second, most of the blood supply comes from the tibia and the femur. So if there are receptors, uh, if there are blood vessels at the tibial end of the ACL and there are some receptors at the femoral end, if there is a tear in the ACL right in the mid substance, it's very unlikely and difficult for the blood supply to reach the mid substance of the ACL and healing to ensue. Next. 
unfortunately if you want to do a perfect anatomic acl reconstruction that means you want to recreate anatomy it's not going to be isometric because the original acl itself is not isometric and last we must discuss for proprioception so that's one thing that's been researched about but we don't know a lot about it so there are mechanoreceptors at the tibial end of the acl and at the femoral end and they lead to joint position sense so if you ask the patient to just close their eyes and you try and manipulate the knee in supine position or a leg hanging and you stop it at a certain angle all normal people generally know where their knee is and at what position their knee is but if the proprioception is lost then this joint position sense is lost and we really don't know the answers if acl reconstruction gets us gets that back we move on to the next part that's diagnosis so what do i want to know generally when i ask history only three simple things the activity level the injury mechanism and certain extras of course goes without saying that anybody you want to assess uh, on whether you want to treat the acl instability or not comes from the fact that the person comes and says ki confidence kam lag raha hai pair thoda unstable lag raha hai so that's a given in history but we want to know three things so what does the injury mechanism tell us the injury mechanism gives us a clue to what other parts of the knee can be involved of course it tells us whether it's a contact versus a non contact what about the activity level so the activity level is very important because i would treat a middle aged housewife differently and an 18 year old differently the activity level is important because if you want to go into certain deep flexion positions say a bharatanatyam or a kathak dancer uh, the hamstrings would play a very important role or if you want to talk about a striker who is dominant foot is injured so then he needs that power striking force and maybe a btb graph would be better next the activity level affects the recovery level because we know that whatever the pre surgery or pre prehab or pre rehab level that's what's going to be achieved after 6 months and 1 year of rehab as well so we can't have somebody who's doing nothing and then taking treatment or undergoing surgery and then expecting a lot out of his knee what are the extras that we want to know about again all of these will affect my surgical choice or what kind of treatment that person is going to need the weight or the bmi smoking any previous surgeries or a previous acl reconstruction done and whether that has failed and why that has failed and what has happened and of course when we see certain professional players we want to know what their contracts are and what what season they whether their seasons ongoing whether they have any acute uh, acute important things that they want to consider other than surgery so there are people asking on the chat what's the differ difference between a repair and a reconstruction and can you please repeat the graph selection we are going to go on with the presentation and both of these points will be covered subsequently so what are the examination maneuvers or examination points that you want to see so we spoke of three things in history we want to know about the activity level you want to know about the injury mechanism and you want to know about certain extras like the weight of the patient whether the person smoking or not and any previous injuries five simple tests just for plain simple acls uh, we are not going to be discussing other ligament injuries in this presentation because uh we'll exceed our time limits so the two simple ones that i don't want to talk about are the anterior drawer and the lockman so the anterior drawer is done at 90 degrees and the lockman at around 30 both of them are pretty simple to evaluate all you need to do is judge the anterior tibial translation by putting the thumb at the joint line and seeing whether it comes ahead or not there's a lot of confusion about how the pivot shift test is to be done and whether it makes any difference to our evaluation so now the uh, now in the sense it's pretty old so we've been doing this since the last 6 7 years this was published in 2012 there's a standardized way of doing a pivot shift and i would like to like all of you to see this video
very simple test to do and gives us a lot of information. So we know that the ACL only doesn't help with anterior and posterior movements. So it's just not something that stops anterior tibial laxity or translation. There is some rotational movements that it helps with as well. And the pivot shift is one of the best ways to check that. So we have the anterior drawer, we have an anterior lockman, and we have the pivot shift. Next, the simplest thing that uh, we actually were in process of publishing around three years back, uh, it got subsequently published, is something called as a heel height test. So the first video that's gonna play is more important generally for two subsets of patients. Subset one is uh, patients with generalized hyperlaxity. If there are patients with generalized hyperlaxity, if you see the uninvolved knee, then they have a certain amount of hyperextension. And if you see the other knee, then there's going to be a greater degree of hyperextension at the knee compared to the normal side. So patients with hyperlaxity. And second, for patients with ACL and PLC concomitant injuries, so if you have an injury to the posterior capsule or the posterolateral structures in addition to the ACL, then you're going to see the same difference. So what we are checking is the heel height. So the normal leg, the heel won't come off the table a lot, whereas the affected leg, the heel will come off a lot more. So that's how it's to be done. Simple to do and gives us a lot of information. Now, uh, the next video is very interesting and this is something that we are just in process of publishing. The validity of this test, now, that gentleman there on the screen is Alessandro Lely. When he was in Mumbai uh, around two years back, this is when he showed us uh, how it's to be done. And he said that the sensitivity and the specificity of this test is 100%. Now, we had our We've done our research on this and we see that it's around 70% sensitive and around 80% specific. This is called the Lely's test or the liver sign. Especially great when it's done under anesthesia. So great for us clinicians, but I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't have heard of this or wouldn't be doing this, but you can include it in your daily practice and it's very useful.
is it can can everyone hear the audio whoa okay okay i was assuming that everybody is hearing the audio all right anyways so the video was pretty much self explanatory what he was trying to say is basically the audio is in italian that's so, so doesn't make a difference if you couldn't hear it but you could see how it was performed and uh, that's something that you can read on it's called the lever sign and then you can start using it right so once you test the knee so you tested the knee with an anterior draw an anterior lockman a pivot shift and you can use the other ancillary tests like the heel height and the lelys test then you want to try and see if there are other parts of the knee that are injured other than the acl so what all that you do during the examination what all do you do so you must check the range of motion and the effusion so especially in acute injuries uh, the range of motion may be affected and there may be a lot of hematrosis what this does is affects the quadriceps and there is reflex quadriceps inhibition and it will affect our decision making regarding the timing of surgery so we want a quiet knee nice knee good kid before we operate so there should be full range of motion no effusion and great contraceps contraction before we think of any surgery next we check for tenderness and we palpate different parts of the knee why that's important is anything that's tender uh generally the capsule overlying it also becomes tender so it's very easy to find out medial and lateral meniscus issues if we check for joint line tenderness apart from that we can actually palpate across the length of the mcl the lcl as well and try and get some clues the quadriceps of, of course is important it affects the recovery then we do certain stress tests and dial tests and we won't go into that uh, to check for other ligament issues and we look at previous scars so that's important because we need to know what graft needs to be selected after seeing other parts of the knee you need to see other parts of the body so there are four or five basic things that we always check before an acl uh, management is discussed so that includes limb alignment why the limb alignment is important is because it affects the quantum of treatment so if we have a patient uh, who's 19 years old she's a dancer she has an acl tear she's on the heavier side she has a valgus knee and she has a high velocity high grade pivot shift in addition to an anterior drawer and a lockman all of this means that i may not offer just a simple plain acl reconstruction but add a lateral extra articular tenodesis or some other procedure as well so the limb alignment is important the weight is important generalized laxity is important again it affects the quantum of treatment and of course when we are handling pediatric adolescent patients then we don't so often use the tanner staging but there are a lot of other radiological examinations that give us an exact bone physiologic age of the patient more important in girls uh, because if the physis is open then the surgeries need to be done in a different way right next after examination history and examination we've all we crossed the 1 hour mark finally so that's me taking too much time uh the important parts of the presentation that are pending are what we do with surgery so the repair and reconstruction what grafts we use and the rehab so we'll just go ahead what are the different things that you can see on this x-ray here so just dwell on it for another 10 seconds and then we start discussing so what i can see in this x-ray is it belongs to an adolescent because the physis doesn't appear to be fused completely next i see the suprapatellar pouch that's full so there's hematrosis next if you can see the lateral then you can see a fragment that's come off the tibia that indicates that there is an acl avulsion on the coronal what i can see is a fragment of bone that's come off the tibia closer to the fibula and that's something called as a segens fracture so the segens fracture also has a different connotation so the moral of these two x rays is that we shouldn't always rely on mris there are certain things that we don't need the mri for and we can pick up on the x ray itself now if we need to read the mris 
there are a lot of images and most physiotherapists and general physicians get confused as to what's to be looked at. My suggestion to you would be just to look at a T1 or a T2 sagittal image or an oblique sagittal image or something called as a TD fat sat image. And what you can see is the patella. And then uh, there's the femur tibia and that's how the ACL looks. On the coronal image, you can see the ACL and so you can see the same thing on the axial as well. But the important one is the sagittal cut. So most ACL tears are divided into four parts. Either you can have an ACL tearing off from the femur. It can tear mid-substance. It can tear from the tibia, which is very rare. Because most of the times, if it has to come off the tibia, it's going to take a piece of bone and then come off, which is more seen in children and adolescents. So there are six sagittal, oblique sagittal images of the knee here. What you can see on the first is a normal ACL. And then if you see something fuzzy like this, this is an ACL strain in older patients around 45, 55 60, if you see this kind of an x-ray, it's going to be reported as a mucoid ACL. So basically, that's the fibers that are getting fuzzy. Then you have a partial ACL. So if you can actually see the outline of the ACL, but there's something wrong in the middle, and then that's where you have issues. Then if you can see a fragment of the bone coming off the tibia, then that's a tibial ACL avulsion. If you can hardly see anything at all on the femoral side, but you can see some fibers from the tibia till the mid substance and some white, white water kind of density, hyper intensities on the femoral side, that's most likely a tear from the femur. And then if you can't see anything at all, or you can just see empty spaces, then that's a complete ACL tear. So when you come to talk about management, I want to just give you a short note about who Mirjana Vemazovic is. So she's a handball player and she must be around 52, 56 right now. This was recently reported by Aspata. Has anyone heard of Mirjana? So she won the gold medal for handball in 1984 Olympics at Los Angeles. And then her team was placed around fourth in the 1988 Olympics. Just six weeks before the 1988 Olympics, she had a bucket handle medial meniscus tear for which she visited the doctor. At that time, the doctor diagnosed her with bilateral ACL injuries. And the doc inquired since when she was carrying them. And she came out with a history where she said that before the 84 Olympics, two years before that in 1982, was when she had her first episode of buckling and that was her first ACL. The following year, the other knee also buckled. So in 83, she had the other knee's ACL, but her doctor, but, but she never had any issue with her knees to visit the doctor. So she always found that there's something wrong with her knee, but it was more irritating than disabling. So she competed in the 84 Olympics with bilateral ACLs, but didn't visit the doctor. She visited a doc in 1986 for her bucket handle medial meniscus and after prolonged discussion, the treatment offered was just the bucket handle medial meniscus excision. She competed in the 88 Olympics with bilateral ACL instabilities and her team was placed fourth. Following the Olympics, she took a decision to never get the ACLs treated because she never had any disability. It was just irritating to her. So what is, no, who is Mirjana? So Mirjana is a coper. So there are a lot of potential copers in the society who have ACL issues, but they may not need surgery. And it is a responsibility to find out who these potential copers are. So if you have 100 patients, then only around 50 of them are going to have uh, no concomitant injuries. That means no meniscus or cartilage or other ligament issues. Out of those 50, if you can screen them, and that's why the two photographs on top over there, that's Lynch Lider, Mac, uh, Lynch Lider Mackler, and that's John Nyland. So both of them have done 
great amount of research on these topics on how to find out potential copers. So the University of Delaware really has some great research on how you can screen them. So if you have 25 who then out, out of the 100, 25 people who you think have passed those tests, then you can put those 25 on a non-operative rehab protocol and maybe you'll have around 15 of them who don't need surgery at all. So 15% of patients out of 100 may not need ACL surgery if you're able to screen them, find them and put them on the right protocol. So how we check or what we do, we do these tests and if of course there's no tear on the MRI, then there's conservative. If there's any associate injury, then there's always surgery. And if there's a partial tear or there is an isolated ACL tear, then we can technically find out the potential copers. And that's Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, I think, is from the University of Pittsburgh. And with Lynn schneider Mackler, they've, they've had this decision-making scheme for returning patients to where they were. So these include certain basic things, and I'm not going to go into details, and you can read this article. But there were five things that you can check especially ask the patient, is your knee giving way? And if the knee isn't giving way, then you can put them on rehab protocols. Next, when you're discussing treatment, so this is a textbook that's very easily available on Amazon. Uh, that's my mentor, Dr. Sachin Tapas. We and we've also contributed chapters to this textbook. It talks about basics of ACL repair, avulsion fixation, reconstruction, any additional procedures and revision ACLs. So I told you that the ACL can tear at four points. If it comes off the femur and you catch the knee in the first three weeks, then there is a good way in which you can repair this back over there. If it comes off the tibia, and you, if the patient comes to you in the first three weeks, there's a good chance you can actually sew it back and you can repair the ACL. If the bone fragment comes off, then the treatment's very simple. The bone needs to go back to where it has come from. And that means that's an avulsion fixation. And if the ACL tears anywhere in the middle, that's mid-substance. Or the patient presents to you after three to six weeks of the tear, then there is no chance that you can repair the ACL and you need an ACL reconstruction. So you saw the D, uh, you saw the C, that's a repair of the tibia, tibial side tear of the ACL. And uh, we've published on that. So one of the only techniques to repair the tibial sided avulsion of the anterior cruciate ligament so I'm just going to run through that. What we do is, you can see this is the ACL and it's come off the tibia. And we are looking at the arthroscopic picture from the left knee, for the left knee. And we take stitches around the ACL. Okay, so all of this was not possible see, around five years back. But this is entirely possible now. And once those stitches are taken, we drill tunnels in the tibia. So I know this is going to be very difficult to understand, but what we do is this. We take sutures and take them out of the tibial tunnels and tie them outside. Now, again, the other way around, if the ACL is going to be torn from the femoral end, then what we can do is find out first, okay, it's come off the femur. So the entire ACL is almost normal. So why reconstruct it when you can repair it? So we take stitches around the ACL and then we use special suture anchors and fix it back over there. So that's the final picture and we augment it with certain other things and that's an ACL repair. So we haven't reconstructed, we haven't given the patient any graft that leaves a lot of potential mechanoreceptors intact. Uh, that gives us uh, a lot of scope and play if this patient happens to injure the ACL again. Uh, a lot of advantages of repair wasn't done frequently earlier because we don't have universally great results. Probably people did not realize that there is a very narrow indication to what can heal and what can't. No mid-substance tears can undergo a repair. So since we have these narrow indications now, if we have the right patients, we can put the patient up for a repair after discussing and offering it to them. 
as far as reconstruction is concerned in india generally most surgeons are using just three kinds of grafts either we use the hamstrings we use the btb or we use the cord tendon the general preference in our indian surveys is most orthopedic surgeons use a lot of the hamstrings uh, most of us now have resorted to just using the semi tendinosus and we spare the gracilis again the philosophy is try and keep as much of the original as possible so since i'm a smith and nephew man this is a video that just talks about the acl reconstruction i'm going to run you through it so you can see the femur and the tibia and for the first thing we do is create a femur tunnel that's independent of the tibial tunnel then we create a tibial tunnel separately so these two tunnels are just for the graft to go through then there's a button that's to be put at the top end around which uh, the graft and here in a, in this case you can see a semi tendinosus that has been looped around is put so you can see the button here and the graft behind so this button then goes on the femoral cortex and this loop between the button and the graft gradually shortens depending on what tension we want to put on the graft so you will see it once it goes into the knee we also mark how much of the graft we want in the tunnels so this is around say 2 cm and that's the amount of graft that's going to go into the femur next after marking the graft on the table and we assume that we treated everything else in the knee like the meniscus and the cartilage we are going to shuttle the graft through from the tibia onto the femur and make sure that the button comes out on the lateral femoral cortex there are a lot of implant fixation devices to be used during acl reconstruction and every surgeon has their own choice very recently most of us have started using something we called as an adjustable loop so this is what you are seeing here the adjustable loop is something where uh we can actually tension the acl much better than we used to earlier so you can see the button that's come out of the femur and it's flipped it's like your shirt button and this loop now can gradually be shortened by using the hands so you can see that the loop is shortening and the graphs going up and we can titrate how much of the graft we want inside the femur so we have around 2 cm of graft in the femur which we marked earlier and then you can fix it on the tibial side by a multitude of options so there are bio screws there are titanium screws there's something called as a suture disc or a post that you can use on the tibia by far and large uh, most of us naya generation surgeons would want to use something that dissolves and becomes bone better and we've done some tribology and some research at the institute of technology bombay iit where uh, this one that you can see the regenerzob by smith and nephew is something that has the correct concentration of hydroxy apatite and beta tcp that becomes bone very soon so that's the button at the top the screw at the bottom and the acl graft in the middle that's what an acl reconstruction means now there are different kinds of acl re constructions that again we can dwell on in very short so most of us right now are doing single bundle acl reconstructions thanks to a publication from our side that says that indian patients have very small tibial and femoral footprints that means that if you do a double bundle acl reconstruction in most indians then you will be overstuffing the knee joint and that may give rise to a flexion deformity post surgery because you won't get full extension unless we intraoperatively measure the patient's footprints and find that the footprints are more than 14 mm in all dimensions we shouldn't be doing a double bundle acl reconstruction trans tibial was a way where uh, some of the older surgeons still do it that way where they first make the tibial tunnel and they make the femoral tunnel through the tibial tunnel we don't do it anymore most of us now have resorted to doing an anatomic that means we try and get the acl back to exactly where it has torn off from anatomic single bundle antromedial portal acl reconstruction but we do individualize it that means if i see somebody who is 6 feet 4 inches has come from kashmir uh, has a huge femur and great big footprints then yes even i would go for an for a double bundle acl reconstruction 
Next, recovery and return. So by far and large, rehab is divided in two parts. So there's general standard rehab and accelerated rehab. And it's been proven without doubt that you can accelerate the rehab without any effects to the graph. You shouldn't fuss over CPM and bracing. Encourage early weight bearing and no open chain quadriceps activity for the first six weeks. There are a lot of criteria for return to sport, but uh, the important thing is that you wait, wait for time because the graft to heal to the bone is going to take six to eight months. And you shouldn't allow absolute return to sports and performance before that. Some polls from my side. So the body loves symmetry. So every time you're seeing a patient with an ACL, pre-surgery, post-surgery, two years after surgery, the only thing that you should be concerned about is the injured and the uninjured leg shouldn't have more than 10% of asymmetry. So all the strengths, uh, the quadriceps, isokinetic strength and the range of motion, everything should be within 10% of each other. Next, if you have a patient with an ACL reconstruction or repair with a meniscus and you started weight bearing and you see that on the third or the fourth day the patient has developed some effusion, that's a sign of the knee crying. So respect effusion in the knee and make sure that you don't progress rehab fast, keeping the effusion in check always. Bracing is a placebo unless it's functional. So there are certain companies like Donjoy and uh, Osur that have functional ACL and PCL braces. I would really recommend them for PCL cases uh, because many a times we have an isolated PCL and we're going to treat it conservatively and that's where the functional brace works the best. Anything other than that, whether you're using a knee cap or a hinge knee brace or a hinge knee cap, doesn't make a difference. We're gradually moving towards functional recovery testing working better than just waiting and at six and eight months trying to evaluate whether we can send the patient back. So there are a lot of functional recovery tests. Again, you can look into John Nyland and Lynch Schneider Mackler's work and Howard Moxness. So the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center does, uh, has done a lot of research on functional recovery testing and you can go through their publications as well. Last, RTS is different from RTP. So RTS is return to sports and RTP is return to performance. So just because you can go back to say, you can send a Kabaddi player at one year back into their training and playing Kabaddi post an ACL reconstruction doesn't mean that your surgery is a success. We've had one or two issues where uh, they have come back to us after injuring their ACLs again. That means they were ready to return to sport, but they were still not ready to perform at the same level as earlier. So that's about it. You have my number here and that's my email ID. Now we should try and discuss a few questions uh, and I'm going to answer everything that's on the chat. I had a few case studies and all, but like you can see, we are at one hour and 18 minutes. Uh, that's a long time and we need to quickly wrap up. So what do you recommend for a grade 2 ACL tear? Conventional or operative treatment? So we didn't discuss the grading of ACLs, a grade 1, 2 or a 3. And uh, the simple way to remember it is a grade 3 is a complete ACL. A grade 2 is not a complete ACL but something is torn. And grade 1 for all practical purposes is not torn. So I would suggest as far as isolated injuries are concerned, you do a grade three. You can offer, uh, find out if a grade three ACL is a potential copa or not. And if not a copa or there are any other concomitant injuries, they go in for surgery. As far as grade twos are concerned, we need to know whether the patient's complaining of subjective instability or not. If the patient's not complaining of subjective instability, and you don't get a Lely's test that's positive, there are no concomitant injuries, then you can safely conserve the patient. Okay, uh, how do you check patient is a COPA or not and when to check? That's great. So when to check is simple to answer as soon as the patient's with you. And how to check? Uh, I, I gave you those two names so you can go in and uh, there are different things that you can check for. So most of the sports physiotherapists talk about the hop test. So there's a triple hop test and there's a single hop and there's a crossover hop and five of those and a lot of other tests that you can do. 
but you need to read those papers and then find out which one which which are the best that work for you uh there is a group called as the moon group so that's it's an orthopedics outcome group and that has a paper on the acl rehab guidelines and you can look into that as well to try and check who are copers or not right why semi tendinosus graft instead of the gracilis graft so when we talking of these grafts we are trying to uh just just could you excuse me for a second hello right can you hear me i'm sorry again yeah can you hear me okay great so we are talking of why semi tendinosus so most of the times when we select a graph for an acl we wanted to replicate the natural acl as far as possible the tension flexion curve of the natural acl so we don't want something that's very rigid so somebody had asked about using the peroneus longus uh we we never use the peroneus longus for an acl because one we strongly believe that if you have any injury to a certain part of the body then it's philosophically wrong to try and violate another part of the body try and to try and treat a certain other part so my ankle colleague dr abhishek kini would kill me if i use the peroneus longus to treat the acl it has its biomechanical effects on the ankle as far as the semi tendinosus is concerned it is stronger and biomechanically better stiffer compared to the gracilis to use for the acl um slatan was operated for arthrex repair which was a novel technique so slatan ibrahimovic was operated uh, by a double bundle acl by freddy fu in pittsburgh so you can imagine that this gentleman is tall huge must be having a great footprint and that's why a double bundle worked better so what's unique with slatan is that slatan actually went back to playing professional football and played his first game for manchester united at 5 months and 5 days after his surgery so he's broken all rules of recovery after acl right no open chain activity till 6 weeks in both repair and reconstruction that's true because uh, uh, so when we talk of open chain again there's a lot of debate so most of the times the general consensus is no open chain activity no extension between 30 degrees and 0 degrees so 100 to 30 degree range is considered pretty safe but uh, we generally try and avoid a 30 to 0 and 100 to 30 is allowed do mid substance tear surgeries work well or conservative so mid substance tears of the acls are generally uh, the only ones that need surgery on day 1 itself so it's very likely that they will not respond is there any specific time period after which the test should be performed which test do you prescribe any kind of brace post acl reconstruction yes i do so i mentioned that uh, the braces after an acl reconstruction have a great placebo effect so we generally have a long knee brace for 2 weeks after an acl reconstruction because we don't want any patient to leave the knee in a flex position so the one thing i keep telling my physiotherapists always is that extension 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 there should be no ffd after an acl at all right uh, after 2 weeks then we graduate them to a hinge knee cap or a hinge knee brace that we leave up to 6 weeks to assess the whole limb alignment is a scanogram required that's an excellent question so that's brilliant so we don't take a scanogram for all primary acl reconstruction patients or patients up for a repair or a reconstruction but adolescents uh, anybody more than 35 or 40 years of age any previous history of acl reconstruction everybody is subjected to a scanogram so in certain adolescents if i feel that the valgus component is too much then we would be offering a distal femoral osteotomy to try and correct the excessive valgus and in any patient more than 35 or 40 if there's any constitutional varus that's significant or in a patient who's received surgeries before if there 
with any medial compartment osteoarthritis, then the patient will be offered a high tibial osteotomy, a medial open wedge, in addition to the ACL reconstruction. Because the coronal slope of the tibia is as important as the sagittal slope. So if the sagittal posterior tibial slope is more than 12 degrees, or there is medial compartment osteoarthritis, then we need to correct the tibial slope. Sagittal and coronal, both are important. Donjur and Osur, Donjoy and Osur are functional brace bands. Yes, so Donjoy and Osur are uh, brands. If you want the numbers, then you can just ping me on this number and then I'll share the numbers with you. How do we diagnose an ACL tear on field? I think when you're on the field of play and you're the sports exercise physician, suppose somebody has any musculoskeletal injury, especially a lower limb injury, the idea is not to diagnose an ACL tear on the field. The idea is just to find out if the injury is significant enough and if the patient, uh, if the player can actually go back to playing or not. So there are simple things that you're going to check and they include the same things that we discussed. So you're going to check for a hemarthrosis. You're going to check if the range of motion is free. Check for tenderness. Can you speak on rehab after three months? Um, yes. So that's the best time actually uh, for somebody else other than a physiotherapist to step in. So we have a transition trainer or a transition physiotherapist between two and three months or we generally guide these patients to our trainers at the gyms. This is speaking not about absolute professional elite athletes but patients who come to us with road traffic accident, two-wheeler injury, dancing injury, and people around you in the society. So at three months, we want to graduate them to running on the treadmill, uh, increase in perturbation training, and a lot of other things which can't be done with a plain, simple physiotherapy visit. So they must join a gym, and then we can take it from there. So for all those who want the rehab protocol in detail, again, you can just message me or email me, and we'll share you our rehab protocol as well. What is the criteria and timeline to clear an athlete for football? So the return to sport criteria, uh, I'm going to go back to this slide. One second. Yeah, why don't you look at this paper and that gives the criteria. So that's in sports health in 2015, the moon guidelines, ACL reconstruction, rehabilitation. That gives you some criteria and the timeline is around eight months. Eight to nine months is when you can clear someone, especially where there is more than 90% symmetry between the two knees uh, in all the tests. What are your views on gait deviations after ACL reconstruction? Right. So uh, generally the answers to such questions dwell around philosophy. So gait deviations after ACL reconstructions are to be taken seriously, but I won't focus on them too much because most of the patients that you're looking at, if they are not professional elite athletes, then I'm sure they have some trunkal or limb dominance even before they injured their ACL. The idea is just to work towards symmetry and if you can get them rid of their trunkal and limb dominance, then I won't dwell on the smaller specifics of the gait. Does rehab differ for femoral and tibial ACL? Um, I didn't get that question. I'm sorry. Pain after three months post-surgery. Can you explain the reasons? There are a lot of reasons uh, related to pain three months after surgery. The commonest scene in our practice and in uh, literature is a flexion deformity. So there are various reasons why a patient may have a subtle flexion deformity after an ACL at three months. And they can range from a cyclops lesion of the ACL to just uh, poor rehab to posterior capsular contractures, uh, complex regional pain syndrome after surgery and a lot of other things. So if we have to treat this with rehab, uh, the general guideline is just stretch, 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 forget strengthening, forget getting more flexion range, just try and get rid of the flexion deformity. If you can get rid of the FFT, that's the way you're going to solve the pain. Uh, and a lot of uh, patella glides 
if there's pain inflection. Now we have one case in the last three years where we haven't been able to get rid of the FFT at one year post ACL surgery and the patient wasn't happy. So what we've done is gone in and done an arthroscopic posterior capsular release. So that ensures that the knee goes from around five to 10 degrees of FFT to straight and uh, the patient got better. Is it okay to perform a straight leg raise? Of course it is. There are other tests like Slocum test. Oh yes, so there are a lot of other tests that we didn't discuss. So the ones that I depend on generally are the dial and the varus and the valgus. Of course we do the Slocum and uh, a lot of others as well. Like we do an anterior drawer in internal rotation, an anterior drawer in external rotation. But maybe we can have a lecture again to try and uh, discuss multiligament instability or just clinical examination of the knee. Yes, so hydrotherapy, aqua therapy is one of the best adjuncts. Uh, so one of the best is well put. Yes, there are lots of other things as well. But for all those who have access, it's great because you don't load the knee. Most of the times after a meniscus or cartilage repair, if you've done a concomitant ACL reconstruction, you want the knee to move as frequently and as quickly as possible, but you don't want to load it. So weight bearing is an issue. And that's where hydrotherapy comes in. Does rehab differ for ACL due to femoral avulsion or tibial avulsion? Yes. So if you're doing a tibial avulsion fixation, uh, if you're joining bone to bone, then we are more confident that it's going to heal pretty quick and bone to bone heals in around six weeks. So you don't have to wait for graft incorporation or soft tissue to bone incorporation and uh, pediatric adolescent tibial avulsion fractures of the ACL when fixed should be absolutely perfect and uh, having full range of movement can transition to the gym in around a month or two. Whereas, uh, if you're doing an ACL repair, so soft tissue to bone, it's going to be way worse than a standard ACL reconstruction. Stem cell therapy plus rehab. So if you have a grade 2 ACL or if you just have a partial ACL single bundle tear, like a posterolateral bundle tear, uh, where the AM bundle is intact and you have a grade 2 Lockman or a draw, then these are the patients where you can offer that okay, I'm going to inject some PRP into the tone bundle and wait and watch if it resolves. So there is no great level one evidence that it works, but it's a school of thought and it is possible. Does early weight bearing differ for repair and reconstruction? Yes, we are very scared of our repairs and uh, a reconstructed patient can weight bear immediately, whereas a repair you'd be very careful and uh, cautious and we really don't know if the same accelerated rehab protocol will work for the repairs. As of now, we restrict our weight bearing for the first two to four weeks. Is it possible of doing an MUA in case of FFD or more than 30 degrees after seven to eight weeks? Wow, 30 degrees at seven to eight weeks is huge. So this patient's probably having a, a complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS kind of a picture. So before you try the MUA, my suggestion is you can start the patient on certain angiolytics. Our favorite is prothiadin, that's dothapin. You can start the patient on pregabalin and high doses of vitamin C. And like I said, just work towards reducing the FFD. So you can do a lot, there are a lot of techniques of working with the FFD and there are some videos as well. If you can message me, then we'll share those with you. What is the ideal time to check for ligament after reconstruction and in conservative management? No, I didn't get that question. I'm sorry. We can have a lecture on total knee replacement. Yeah, sure. So I'm a knee surgeon. And at the end of answering all the questions, I would request you to just write down what kind of a lecture around the knee you would like next. And we can schedule that on Saturday or Sunday. I can speak on partial and total knee replacements, yes, or medial compartment osteoarthritis or anything that you talk about. Dynamic cords are recommended immediately. Uh, so you can have closed chain kinetic, closed kinetic chain dynamic cords and open kinetic chain dynamic cords. So the closed chain are recommended, very safe. Why do we use hamstring tendon more than BTB? 
most of our indian patients are concerned about anterior knee pain so if you have a patient that has patella baha or somebody who loves to uh, do khamashna that's a jain position of prayer or muslims who have to do namaz then we won't prefer anything from the anterior aspect of the knee we can have a lecture on the clinical examination of the knee for sure right so i think we are done oh we have 44 more messages okay uh, right i think we're going to close here so last thank you so much for all the time and sparing 1 hour and 35 minutes of your time your opinion of tibial plateau fracture you can message me and i can answer that one thank you so much we'll just decide on what we can talk on next and then ping you yes thank you so much bye bye